Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. It's great to see so many of you, trust me. Half an hour earlier, I was like, okay, how many people I'm going to have in the room considering the torrential rainfall. So special thanks to all of you for having braved this weather and to join us here this evening. I'm delighted to know that people are actually getting information on the programs and there are people from Bombay and Bangalore in this room. Uh, makes me feel good. And uh, hopefully you all won't have to travel so much unless, of course, it's for a terrific speaker like Dean Bruner, but we will do more programs in other cities going along. Um, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's really great to have two wonderful people on the podium, so I am not going to do much of introduction on that. I'll leave it to Ambassador uh, Rana to introduce our speaker for the day. I just want to take a couple of minutes on admin stuff. One, if you all could please put your phones on silent because it's very disturbing to the speaker. Uh, second, the proceedings of all our programs are recorded on video and are available on our website. So when during the question answer session, please do announce yourself very clearly who your, and your affiliation. So it's very nice when people are watching later on to know who was asking what question and even for the speaker to respond appropriately. So if you can do that, and of course, eventually join us for a cup of tea after the program uh, right here in the next room. Thank you, and over to you, Ambassador Rana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, my congratulations to all of you for having braved the weather. I mean, clearly, uh, Aspen India do a good thing, get virtually fill a hall on a, on a tough day like today when uh, this is not seasonal weather, you know, I, mid-September you don't normally have such heavy rainfall, but that's like it happens. And rain is a blessing in our country anyway, that's how we see it. So Professor Brunner, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here, to um, request you to speak on your chosen subject, uh, which is competencies of the new global leader. We all know that the United States, uh, perhaps more than any other country in the world, is uh, fascinated, uh, one might even say mesmerized, by the notion of leadership. Uh, I think this particular uh, contribution to the discourse, not just on managing business, but I think on societal affairs. Uh, the Aspen Institute, the of, of Aspen, Colorado, is also very much committed to and very much involved with leadership development. So it is entirely fitting, entirely appropriate that uh, we should get uh, somebody who is a published author, distinguished uh, uh, teacher of business uh, to talk to us uh, on this particular subject. Uh, sir, I will not stand between you and the audience. I think the arrangement is, the program that we have planned it, is that uh, you may wish to speak for about 30 minutes. Uh, after that, uh, in the Aspen style, we will have a conversation between the two of us. I may put to you a few questions and then we will open it up and we will uh, end the program uh, sharp at 17.30 uh, uh, hours, at 5.30 in the afternoon. Sir, the floor is yours. Engage with you in this, uh, what I hope would be more of a seminar style discussion. I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague, Catherine Alford, who is uh, a member of the Darden School uh, staff and joining me on this trip. I'm here in India to reach out to corporations, uh, other universities, certainly prospective applicants, and, and I'm receiving a tremendously warm welcome here this week. I've just come from Japan, where I sent, spent a similar week uh, reaching out to companies, universities, prospective applicants, and there could not be a more stark contrast between the two economies and cultures, and I'll have a little bit more to say about that in the course of my remarks. But <clears throat> my uh, topic is uh, 
globally competent and confident, the new global leader. Um, this is uh, motivated by three questions, four questions. The uh, first is technical mastery simply sufficient as a basis for global enterprise leadership? The answer is no, and, and if not, uh, what, what else would there be than simple technical mastery? <clears throat> the second simply addresses the question of the balance between global versus local knowledge. The third said, uh, says, how should uh, uh, companies and schools respond to the answers to these questions? And, and then I can tell you, if time permits, a little bit about how my school is responding a as a case in point. My hope is that the, my very quick review of slides here will stimulate your thinking uh, so that we can have a vigorous discussion uh, after my remarks. The um, AACSB is one of the leading accreditors of business schools worldwide and they asked me and a dozen other deans of global business schools to lead a study of globalization. What we discovered was simply fascinating. The thumbnail sketch is on the, the screen, but we discovered there are some 13,000 institutions in the world that award degrees in business of some kind. Students have vast choice, but less than 10% of these institutions are accredited, suggesting that we know virtually nothing about 90% of the field. This creates a research opportunity for someone in the audience. I would tell you that schools are collaborating across border at a pace that would dizzy most business developers and most M&A experts in the field. Um, and uh, particular interest is between the developed economies and developing Asia. Um, we, we critiqued the curricula of business schools in the area of uh, globalization and, and uh, the, perhaps the most controversial part of the report concluded that the business schools are not keeping up with the pace of intellectual development uh, emanating from the actual globalization of business. I can tell you more there. And then finally, we, we studied in-depth cases of globalization of business schools and uh, uh, came to the conclusion that one size does not fit all, that schools are testing and experimenting with globalization in a variety of ways to make this field, uh, management education, feel like an early stage industry. Think Bollywood, think Silicon Valley in the early days. Uh, lots of things are being tried. Artists, creative people are doing new things. And, and uh, there's this effervescence of uh, innovation. Of course, following every boom of innovation, there tends to be a bust and a, a, a washing away of uh, those who've done the unfortunate experiments. But I think that bust is uh, many years off into the future yet because this wave of educational globalization has a long run ahead of it. Uh, the, the graph uh, presents a simple conclusion, which is globalization is becoming a larger and larger share of the uh, global GDP. And this is uh, a graph of exports as a percent of world GDP from 1960 to 2007. It rose from about 12% to nearly 29%. Uh, Today in 2011, it's well north of 30%, and everyone simply expects it to continue to grow. In short, globalization is a very big deal and uh, warrants a uh, large place on our collective radar screen. McKinsey, some authors uh, wrote, and I, I love this uh, quotation for what it might stimulate in our thinking, said, more transformational than technology itself is the shift in behavior that it enables. We work not just globally, but also instantaneously. We're forming communities and relationships in new ways more cell phones, more emails, more Google searches, blah, blah, blah. For perhaps the first time in history, geography is not the primary constraint on the limits of social and economic organization. Swallow that and reflect. Um, we, uh, we ask uh, uh, samples of business leaders what uh, they think is important for the development of global leaders. One survey found these results. Um, some thought that global business acumen was the most important, but look at the rest. That only explains about 30% of what people think is important. The rest is leadership characteristics, a global worldview, the ability to manage uh, people and people issues, and, and then the ability to manage enterprises, which presumably includes strategic management. The, the, the deep lesson here is that this is a complicated subject. There's a lot more 
to understanding and developing global leadership than simply um, teaching the basics of business. Uh, certainly more than just technical knowledge is an understanding of places and localities. You may have read the book or heard of uh, The World is Flat by Thomas Friedman, who argued that with technology and global trade, in fact, competition was becoming evened out across the world. Nobody really believes that the world is flat in those terms. Rather, it's lumpy and curvy. And we, we think of four dimensions as being particularly salient. Cultural distance, language, ethnicity, religions, etc. Administrative difference, the difference in laws and uh, regulations, currencies, the risks of expropriation and politics. And then, of course, there's geographic distance uh, that creates remoteness for, for some markets and proximity for others. Uh, differences in size and time zones prove to be quite significant in the way global leaders and managers do their work. Finally, economic distance proves to be of, of great significance. Simply differences in income, GDP per capita, and the like. Uh, the, the, the asymmetric distribution of resources around the world, the, the clustering of rare earths in certain countries, and uh, metals, and, and uh, 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 animal resources in others. Uh, the stability of financial system. Uh, you, you can see that global knowledge remains as relevant, if not more relevant today, in the development of global leaders than ever before. <clears throat> so if, if technical mastery and mere global concepts are not enough, what else is there? As a result of research we've been doing at the Darden School, and my colleagues and I have looked into this great extent, we think of competencies as uh, being a relevant consideration, competencies that build upon the mastery of technical knowledge. Technical knowledge tells you what? As Plato Aristotle would say, it's the, the know what part of knowledge. But there are skills, the know how, uh, how to negotiate, how to sell, how to give feedback in a constructive way, how to motivate others, how to organize people. That's know how. It's often the know how that becomes the underpinning for the, the development of managers. On top of those are attributes of determination, of a bias for action, attributes such as um, uh, integrity and ethical management that often distinguish the leader from the manager. Competencies tell us a great deal about the development of leaders. For indeed, um, research on competencies has been the foundation for helping to distinguish superior performers from others. By now, there's a small mountain of literature on the, the attributes that distinguish the, the high performance from the, the, the middle of the pack. Certainly, competencies can or should be measurable in some respect. And the belief is that competencies can be gained. They are not, they are not inherited uh, attributes or traits. They can be gained and improved with training. So the, the general idea, one of the big ideas I'd love to leave with you today is this notion that competencies in the form of knowledge, skills, and attributes drive observable performance. This is a big deal for reasons I'll tell you momentarily. Competencies are more meaningful bases of, of development than simply a focus on tasks. If there, were, if there were two extremes to think about, it would be a focus on getting a task done, uh, such as... Uh, Filling, uh, filling an order or um, uh, rolling out a, a uh, marketing program versus competencies which might be focused on actually developing an entire pipeline of orders or uh, an entire marketing campaign. So the distinguishing is, uh, what, is it, what is it that we base our, any assessment of leaders on? Under tasks, it would be to compare the leaders against some standard of performance and a focus on competencies instead would focus on uh, behaviors that arrive at these outcomes. We observe under tasks performance against the standard and under competencies the manner of behavior, the success and the, the execution of the behavior. A focus on tasks is very narrow, a focus on competencies is much broader. And frankly, a task-based focus helps us simply distinguish good task workers. Whereas a focus on competencies truly helps us distinguish excellent performance. 
You might think of the, uh, the intelligence test, the IQ test, as, as an extreme example of the, the task-based focus. Uh, criti critics of uh, IQ tests have been telling us for years that IQ tests are wonderful tests of the ability to complete the IQ test. They are not necessarily tests of very effective performance, the ability to marshal people and encourage and create cultures uh, of value and purpose and significance. I think you see where we're going on this. Competency-based approaches are highly valuable to managers because they capture the complexity of success. The standard of excellence is much higher than ever before, thanks to globalization, thanks to technological innovation. We need standards that capture that complexity. Certainly, a focus on competency can improve our service to students if we are universities, or our service to employees if we are managers and corporations. Education is growing more personalized. A focus on competencies permits better tailoring to the uh, uh, individuals involved in the education. Finally, a focus on competencies admits the varieties of ways in which we build competencies. There's classroom learning, there may be online learning, certainly learning on the job and learning in society. The focus on competencies recognizes that the learner doesn't stop learning when he or she exits the classroom. The focus on competencies acknowledges that the learner carries the learning into the world and in real time checks and practices and tests the very concepts that he or she's gained in a formal educational setting. So we, we at Darden uh, created and reviewed a wide range of evidence on global managerial competencies. We looked at what all the academics had to say, public surveys, in-depth surveys of our own corporate partners, and uh, focus group surveys from educators and uh, staff. And we, we have identified 15 clusters of competencies. These embrace the, the what you know, what you can do, and who you are aspects. What's, what's very uh, interesting here is that uh, at the top of the left-hand column, we see one of 15 clusters of competencies. These are the, acu the, the academic areas, functional knowledge, accounting, uh, finance, marketing, and operations. This is the, the element of business acumen, which so many of us for years and years have decided ought to be the focus of management development. But what a wake-up this is to focus on the wider range of competencies now and to recognize that there's so much more to the development of managers. Let me give you an expanded list. This is really an eye test chart for all of you in the back of the room. These are the same 15 elements, but now uh, expanded out to include all the ranges of ideas and comments that we heard in the varieties of research that we conducted. <coughs> Just, uh, we, we could pick any one of these to, to feed your imagination and to feed the discussion, <laughs> but focus on the middle column, midway down, the box that says communication and interpersonal skills. I think we would agree that an effective uh, leader, global leader, would be very effective in listening and observing. Being able to walk into a room of a diverse team and sensing Who's coming from where? Just looking at the body language and the use of words and, and written media and being able to interpret the, the mood of the group. Certainly, a leader carries empathy. A leader is, is able to identify and perhaps feel the emotion in others. Leaders have strong negotiating skills, strong motivational skills, and strong communication or presentational skills. I could go through these other boxes. What, what's, what's very interesting to me in the right-hand column is, is the box of perseverance and tenacity. Um, I know no business school curriculum that includes a course on perseverance. I know none that uh, formally trains people in tenacious uh, stick to in, uh, sticking to the, uh, to the problem at hand until a, uh, a solution is resolved. And yet we hear from managers and from the companies who seek to develop and recruit new uh, talent for their organizations, that <clears throat> these may be some of the most important attributes. I speak of the ability to work hard, to be passionate and persuasive, to demand excellence, the desire to make a difference, to bring energy and, and to have 
high intensity, what a warning. I, I just offer this expanded list, this eye chart to you as a way to stimulate your thinking that there is a lot, lot more to the development of global leaders than uh, simply conveying business acumen. Perhaps the biggest idea in my presentation here today is in this slide. <clears throat> On the left-hand side of the uh, exhibit, you see the way we think currently about the development of management. We, we call it management training. It tends to be knowledge-based, learn this, learn that, and take a test. It tends to be a lockstep program. <clears throat> Everybody moves together through the curriculum at the same pace. It tends to be classroom-based. It tends to be a curriculum that is truly separate and apart from the uh, 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 rest of the experience of the learner. And it tends to be a curriculum that's ethnocentric, that's focused on whatever the dominant culture is at hand. This is a problem, of course, for true multinational corporations for which there may be many highly relevant and appropriate cultures. I'm arguing, as the, as the diagram suggests, that a combination of strategic vision and mission and core values and commitments are driving a rethinking of the way we consider the development of global leaders. Today, the challenge for us is to develop an approach based on a concept of management development not merely management training. This development is necessarily competency-based, not simply knowledge-based. It needs to be customized, or at least much more so. It should be modular and agile, drawing in the actual experience of the learner today. It should be integrated across all of the subjects of business, as well as with the, the work experience, the life experience of the learner, and the, the career setting of the learner. Finally, it probably ought to be delivered in a very high engagement fashion, rather than simply the, the knowledge expert conveying the gems of, uh, of ideas to the learner. <clears throat> there should be some back and forth, some debate, some persuasion through the discussion process. This, I, I submit to you, is at the core of what is a revolution among best practice firms today and is the challenge for all of us, business schools, corporations, and countries. I'll, I'll tell you very quickly as a, as a case study uh, what some of our experience at the Darwin School is. Um, our aim is to prepare leaders. Uh, as, as the ambassador uh, nicely said, uh, we, leadership development is a, uh, an attribute of many of our schools, and the Darwin School is part of that movement. We aim to build skills and attributes, not just knowledge. We're aiming to develop a much broader sense of global reach, confidence, and competence aligned with a deeper sensitivity and appreciation for local context. Those four attributes, culture, administration, geography, and economics. And we do this through our own high engagement approach. We teach by the case method, the Socratic method, which is uh, a, a uh, strong debate or, or uh, engagement, a discussion-based approach. We draw together a faculty who bring great expertise themselves and we seek to combine the experience of students through community, through the direct engagement of one another in class and outside. We have uh, four principal programs just to help you understand our, our tailoring that's going on. In the top row is our uh, uh, flagship two-year residential MBA program aimed at people roughly 28 years old. Now we've offered, a, uh, since 2006, an executive MBA program aimed at people in their late 30s and early 40s, the practicing managers who want broader expertise. This is, this is truly responsive to these competencies that I just uh, highlighted for you a few minutes ago. And this is aimed at helping to take functional experts, functional masters, up to a higher level to become general managers. <clears throat> just last week, we launched uh, the, the third program, a global executive MBA program, GEMBA as it's called, aimed at the same co age cohort, late, four, late 30s, early 40s, but now um, helping to take that uh, person eager for general management expertise, but exposing him or her to a broad context of uh, markets in the world. Finally, we offer a, an executive program that's a month-long um, aimed at people with 20 or more years of work experience 
to help prepare them for work in the, H in the C suite in some respect. Um, our global executive MBA program is an example, uh, a case in point. This program has six uh, residential experiences. The first one and the last one will be in the United States, but in the middle will be trips to uh, Brazil in term two to Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, in term three to uh, Beijing and Shanghai, China, term four to Paris, France, and probably Berlin and London, term five to Delhi and Chennai, India. In between each one of these residencies will be an intensive online learning experience where students uh, do project work together, they have real-time synchronous experiences with faculty, and they uh, uh, engage with one another in learning teams and individual work. The point is that this, this brings much greater breadth and uh, uh, immersion into the varieties of cultures and business settings than any other program we offer, and indeed uh, it, it's characteristic of the best programs in our uh, cohort of business schools. I've covered that. Let's see. We, we've been acknowledged by at least one, of the, one prominent blog for the, the innovation in our program. I would say that our same faculty who are known for uh, excellence in teaching will deliver the program around the world in addition to faculty from partner schools. We're not outsourcing the teaching of this global program. We are engaging very actively our, great, our own great faculty with faculty from our partner schools. This is a focus on global issues, but still of a general management nature, and it intends to build a global perspective from personal immersion, from the diversity of voices, and the materials we use. Finally, I'd say that uh, uh, you, you notice we have three formats of MBA programs, but they all carry the same diploma. This is a, a departure from the practice of some schools who choose to acknowledge executive format programs as an executive MBA rather than just a Master of Business Administration. At our school, we, we take the view uh, that we will, we will warrant that uh, all of the graduates of our programs are Masters of Business Administration uh, and that our um, uh, executive format programs are as substantive and rigorous as our uh, residential program. In conclusion, <coughs> I need not tell you, you experience this day by day, maybe minute by minute here in India, but globalization of business is simply an inexorable force. I tell our students, I tell prospective applicants that this is going to be the dominant theme uh, in, in one's, uh, let us say, 50-year career that lies ahead, and that gaining a strength, gaining a competence and confidence in global management is going to be essential to one's advancement as a global leader. I think... Uh, I, I've talked to many business leaders throughout Asia, North America, and Europe, and what I hear as a constant theme among them is the question, how will we develop the next generation, the next cohort of uh, business leaders in this world? Because whatever the, the development process has been today, it's probably obsolete. And the argument that I presented to you in very, very fleeting fashion this afternoon has been, we need a new story. We need a new way to think about the development of global leaders. And I think it begins <coughs> with uh, the focus on competencies. Business schools, as I've argued, are part of the problem. I think we are part of the solution. And I'd be happy to compare notes with you and hear your comments on what we can and should be doing. But plainly, we need to impart both global concepts as well as local knowledge. knowledge as well as global skills, as well as attributes that underpin high performance leadership. We believe that our own global executive MBA program is one example of this new arena. I thank you so much for your remarks. I hope I've finished in 30 minutes. This was a, a, a rapid tour to a set of ideas. So thank you. Uh, professor, you have you have given us an extremely dense presentation, one that is loaded with so many different thoughts, which clearly sum up uh, your own vast experience, the comprehensive experience of your own institution, and uh, I'm sure that 
in the more or less one hour that we have, 58 minutes, that we will have ample opportunity to explore some of the themes that you have uh, put to us. Uh, you, the word competency is at the heart of what you uh, offer. Am I right, sir? Uh, that's true. Uh, is it your feeling that the development of competencies is not sufficiently addressed in many other programs? I mean, in what particular fashion would you say is your focus on competencies uh, a differentiator or uh, a unique proposition that you bring to the table? That's one of the questions I have. And I have one or two others which I will put to you before we uh, open it up to everyone. Thank well, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, this, this is a, uh, uh, a particularly useful question with which to begin the, the discussion. And I will tell you that um, we, we are emerging from a, a view of leadership development and management and that is focused on tasks, on completing uh, very highly defined uh, processes, ideally in, in uh, uh, a standard uh, set of time and, and uh, hopefully standard performance uh, benchmarks. If one is running a uh, mass production uh, facility uh, with, with thousands of employees, each of whom is doing a, a highly repetitive uh, job, uh, the focus on task may be appropriate or certainly is one way to motivate a study of the efficiency of an operation and its ability to perform and produce products at a desirable level of cost. But we're talking about a very, very different kind of employee here this afternoon. We're talking about somebody who has managerial responsibilities and indeed, the way I've structured this in terms of leadership, it is somebody who is a high performance individual and necessarily, again, as somebody who has the capacity to manage uh, across borders, manage a team that might be highly diverse internationally, uh, manage a project that has risks uh, spread globally, uh, manage a complex um, uh, project development with differing deadlines and, and resource commitments. When, when I express it in those terms, <clears throat> it's very, very difficult to imagine how we would develop a, uh, a global leader based on the task-based point of view. So my argument is the task-based point of view is inadequate. We need, we need to, instead of imagining breaking down this, the work of this wonderful global leader into discrete tasks, we need to begin to lump them together into competencies that um, actually grasp the complexity of what the, he or she, the leader, does. Um, <coughs> I would say that uh, <clears throat> training programs that I've been involved in at corporations and have consulted and advised on, and that I'm sure many of you have been involved in, have over the years in the past been heavily focused on tasks. My argument this afternoon is that that's, that's obsolete. It's being obsoleted by globalization and technology and the, the incredible complexity of the work we face today. Let me put to you a, a different uh, perspective. I'm sure that the 15 particular divisions or uh, points in that you uh, break up competencies in uh, covers uh, the question I have, but nevertheless, let me frame it to you. One of the dangers of a great deal of focus on leadership is that the element of followership is missed out somewhere. Uh, we are in an age where if you ask someone to write uh, a narrative relating to an activity in which she or he may have uh, taken part, the word I, me and myself may figure ten times or more in a paragraph of a dozen lines. I've seen this. 
The point I'm trying to make is that the element of humility, the element of subsuming one's ego is sometimes overlooked. Is there a danger that a great focus on leadership, important as it is, might lead us in that direction? I, thank you. I think this is an excellent question as well. As the saying goes, there is no I in the word team. And I think so much of <clears throat> how we uh, conceive of leaders today is of people who galvanize others, who achieve great results through influence and through uh, eliciting teamwork. This humility of which you speak is indeed, I think, a core attribute of great leaders. Um, it is a, a feature of <clears throat> people who uh, build trust in others. I think that's another Another attribute is uh, ethics and integrity. Uh, we, as we so often remind our students today, uh, the, 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 the power you have as a, as a leader or a manager is not conferred authority. It's not the, the mantle you wear, the title you have. It is based on your ability to win the hearts and respect of the people uh, who report to you and work with you. I think all of these are uh, embraced in this new view of confidence, this, this much more complex view of leadership. And uh, I, I would tell you that uh, one of the most pointed illustrations of this is um, the uh, discussions I had in Japan last week. As you may know, Japan's, uh, J Japan's economy is shrinking today. It's, it's in recession. Many people would in fact say it's, they're, they're, in, they're in the late stage of an ongoing depression uh, since the early 1990s. And the, there's been a great deal of denial. You know, the Japanese culture is, is very uh, homogeneous, and especially in the wake of the terrible crisis in Fukushima, the, the Japanese uh, society has turned inward. There, there is a sharp fall off in uh, student mobility across borders, outbound from Japan to other countries. <clears throat> there's, there's a lassitude of, 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 of why should I get more degrees? Why should I get more training among young people, and uh, the, the senior executives with whom I spoke last week were frankly alarmed at this trend uh, for several reasons. One is <clears throat> their own businesses were plainly not growing because their businesses largely were focused on serving markets in Japan, which is a massive economic market, by the way, and, and ordinarily worthy of service, but in, in their case, they, they were confronting the need to have to do business outside, to turn outward. So the business leaders are, are coming to the realization that they must turn from this inward focus more outwardly. And, uh, uh, and they're asking, where will we get the leaders who will uh, lead, that, uh, lead that charge, lead that uh, transformation of our company? Because for years, they've developed leaders under a very rigid the philosophy of bringing people in at the very bottom and very, very, very slowly working them up a direct ladder until, say, the age of 50 or 55, at which point they begin to assume uh, opportunities for serious initiative, by which time, you know, their, their entrepreneurship, their, their spark of uh, in, ingenuity uh, well, will have been sorely tested, let me put it that way. I think the... Uh, the, the risk of, uh, of uh, uh, <clears throat> forcing people into uh, decades, two decades in the case of Japan, of, of uh, developmental humility is desirable. Certainly it's been part of Japan's cultural success since 1945, but it's also true that we, we can point to virtually every other developed economy and rapidly growing emerging economy and see um, advancement opportunities for young leaders that is um, much more vigorous and open-ended than, uh, than in Japan. So I think there's a middle ground to be struck. We, we, we should train leaders to be humble, to focus on teams, to focus on achieving great outcomes in, in concert with others. But we need to leave the door open for them to break out and for them to experiment and, and uh, lend their fresh ideas in whatever business venue they are.
My final question to you, sir, is uh, one of method. You mentioned online training. Uh, as it happens, I'm also involved in that process. And it's very difficult to get across to people that online uh, teaching can sometimes be even more intensive than face-to-face -face <coughs> teaching. Would you bear me out in that supposition of mine and would you uh, tell us a little bit about how <coughs> online uh, teaching blends with your uh, uh, traditional uh, teaching methods? Thank you very much. This is a provocative question because the Darden School is known for the face-to-face the -face teaching. Uh, we, the, the case method, the high engagement, if you look at all the blogs and the internets and the rankings and what they say about us, they, they, will, they will cite this as one of the premier attributes of our school. So it, it may surprise you to know that actually I am a supporter of online educational uh, initiatives. I have written online tutorials. I believe they are hugely successful for imparting knowledge. They may be successful in, in imparting aspects of skills, but remember, we, we should focus on knowledge, skills, and attributes. And I think somewhere as you get farther up that ladder, you, you necessarily begin to, to confront the limitations of, of online technology. In fact, it was last March at the Aspen Institute in uh, the United States where they convened a gathering of CEOs and business school deans to talk about what we had learned since the global financial crisis and the Great Recession and what were we all going to do differently. And in the middle of this, a very prominent CEO turned to me and said, you business schools are dinosaurs. Bricks and mortar are going to be washed away by the digital revolution, and uh, uh, your, 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 your focus uh, today is completely misguided. Um, and then he stopped. And you can imagine in the middle of a group of 30 or 40 uh, people, the, um, the room fell into a hush, and all the eyes turned to me. And, and you just feel incredibly, you know, uh, focused on at that moment. And I turned to this uh, very accomplished person and I said, I'm willing to bet that everybody in this room has had several experiences in life that could have only occurred with that impact on a face-to-face -face basis. A proposal of marriage, a negotiation of a very difficult uh, transaction. It might have been a labor negotiation, it might have been a, a major contract if you're selling industrial equipment. Um, it might have been giving feedback, a very difficult feedback to an employee whom you don't want to lose but who really needs to sit up and start to fly straight. Uh, so, so giving feedback in a way that, that builds and uh, develops the individual. Uh, it, it may be um, uh, selling, it may be engaging with people, getting to know people from the very start. Uh, um, we, we find increasingly that very effective digital relations uh, across border, across time zones, are usefully begun in person. And quite often, they will begin in venues that don't occur in the classroom. They might occur in a pub or a, a tavern, an Austrian tavern or a British pub or, or a, uh, a uh, jazz um, venue in New Orleans or a, um, a uh, hot tub in Silicon Valley. I think you get the idea. You know, those, those kinds of uh, personal engagement lead to lasting understanding between people that then the digital medium can begin to exploit effectively. But and when I got through saying all of this to the CEO, a hush fell on the room again, and he turned to me and said, well, you know, I really didn't mean to say it as, as uh, thoroughly and, and dogmatically as I did. And so I think the, the end of the tale would just be that the, the, the challenge we face is probably best suited by a blend, using the digital medium where it can be used effectively, but almost certainly the face-to-face the -face engagement will be part of 
the, the battery of resources on which leadership coaches and developers must rely. My only slight point of disagreement might be that some attributes of some aspects of both skills and attributes can also be learned uh, online, but that's a point of detail. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, please. Uh, identify yourself and wait for a microphone to come to you. We'll take clusters of about four questions at a time. I see one, two, three, and four, and we'll come back to all the others. Please, over here, please. I'm Arvinda Brara, Chairman and Managing Director of Mantech Consultants. Um, I had the opportunity to do my MBA in one of the most beautiful campuses in the world, which was in Honolulu, Hawaii. And uh, I'm an engineer, and what struck me was the most learning and enjoyable experience was to learn about behavioral science. <coughs> so my question is that in your curriculum, and it is very impressive the way you have outlined it, and I think it's going to really build good global leaders, but I found that all that was taught as a subject, it did not go into that much depth for people to absorb uh, the understanding of human behavior, which, as you have rightly emphasized, is, uh, is a very important part of uh, global leadership. So, is the Darwin School doing something beyond the normal teaching of a behavioral science as a subject or getting into case examples and, uh, you know, going more into depth than most schools do? Another very quick question is that, uh, you know, the case example method around the world has been based primarily on American case history. Now, there have been a few which come from Japan, from China, maybe Korea. But I want to share with you that India, the rich source of learning uh, to the <coughs> Americans, you know, perhaps which is not understood in that much depth. They do say, oh, India is doing well, you know, we're doing something better than others. But how we are doing better than others, how we are doing better than some of the American companies, uh, that's, I think, if an emphasis in the case example. Point. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So I'd like. Oh, yeah. I am Professor Ramesh Bagla from MIT Business School. While there are some common traits and competencies required in all leaders, be it local or global. But you would agree that there are some very unique traits and competencies whether we see in political arena from Mahatma Gandhi to Obama or in business field from Steve Jobs to Dhirubhai Ambani. The very unique traits. My question is what is Darden doing to spot such unique traits in their students and to build upon them? A professor who asks a short question is to be treasured. <laughs> yes, uh, because professors are programmed to speak for 45 minutes. <laughs> uh, Sunil, uh, from a pharmaceutical company. My question is that, you know, we are talking of the global leaders and they have to, you know, basically work on, uh, we are assuming that they will be working in a very diverse uh, environment. My question is that if you look at, though there's a lot of uh, flattening of the world happening, but still there's a lot of disparity. Uh, even within the emerging world, there's a lot of economic disparity. And if you look at the drivers of the growth of the developed world, it is innovation. And maybe in a very third world or a developing world, it would be the cost factors and other factors. How does this, uh, this disparity or sort of conflict is managed uh, by a new global leader? Thank you. Uh, uh, very good evening to all of you. I am Dr. Survanshi from SP Jain Institute of Management, Mumbai. Uh, this is the Dean's class, so I will not take much of time. Two direct questions to you, sir. One, uh, we have a course on teaching leadership, and we face a dilemma uh, how to encourage uh, entrepreneurial trait, managerial trait, and true leadership trait to the students. So, how do we do that, sir? And the second question is that, 
how do we encourage students for beyond the classroom learning? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. These are great questions. I, I'll do my best to, to respond to them all. Uh, the, um, I see five questions here. The first is uh, regarding behavioral science. Um, you should know that, uh, the, um, that, that one, there are many revolutions occurring in universities at any moment in time, but one of them among business schools is a uh, drive toward uh, much more on research into and focus on teaching human behavior. The, um, the great uh, global financial crisis has taught us that uh, the, the, the models of financial economics, which was my field, is my field of specialty, the models of financial economics don't go far enough in helping us understand the behavior of markets and managers and institutions. There's much more we need to learn, and what we're doing at the Darden School is organizing uh, behavioral labs. We are actively hiring new faculty with, who have a specialty and interest in behavioral research, and this is research that spans finance and marketing and accounting and, and yes, uh, organization design. The, um, uh, the concentration of this human capital, this talent, around the behavioral theme is naturally leading to an outpouring of new teaching material. The Darden School is the world's uh, second largest publisher of business school case studies. We, we distribute uh, many of them here in India and you will see a, a rising tide of new material that reflects the, the behavioral point of view uh, as opposed to what I would call the economic point of view, which was naturally to assume that markets were always well functioning and that managers are always rational and that both would always do the right thing. Um, the, uh, back, uh, the related question regarded case studies, um, we are, for our global program, actually producing an entire new curriculum of uh, case studies that are focused both on the, the five local uh, regions in which we'll bring our students as well as uh, the cross-border issues. It's really not sufficient simply to give students cases that are set in regions other than the ones they're familiar with. The, the, the leading edge in teaching globalization has to do with helping students understand the interface, the, the transference of, uh, of um, problems and solutions across borders because that adds much more complexity. I will tell you that part of our solution is not to write the cases ourselves but to develop them in partnership with our partner schools. We have 15 partner schools around the world and have active case writing programs with I think most of them. Uh, our partner schools here in India are IIM Ahmedabad, the Indian School of Business in Hyderabad, and XLRI in, in, in Jamshedpur. Uh, I just spoke with a leading professor at IIM Bangalore. We may have a, a case writing program about to start with them too. I'm very, very eager to embark on a much wider program of case development, but I think uh, there's more to be said, and I, I especially take your point that there are really important lessons of success focused on Indian organizations and Indian projects and Indian points of view that we can take to the rest of the world and we should. Better late than never. Shame on us for having ignored the successes in India for so long, but I think it's coming. Um, the, uh, we had a great question about <coughs> common traits versus individual traits. Uh, and, and this question picks up on an important theme of my remarks, which is that when you begin to focus on competencies as units of development for uh, uh, leaders, for your high potential workforce, necessarily you need to uh, begin to customize, to personalize the development effort. One size does not fit all. I think that's the old thinking. That's the, that's the task-based thinking of leadership development. Today, we need to focus much more on the needs and opportunities of the individual. What we're doing at the Darden School is commencing a program of what we call end-to-end -end coaching. We, we take uh, students 
We assign, we, we put them through a battery of tests at the outset of their MBA program, assign a, uh, a, it is a life coach, someone who works with them and meets with them periodically through their MBA experience. During the experience, there are a number of instruments and mileposts assessed. This, the, the, the individual is coached against that progress and uh, uh, by the end of it, there's, there's an assessment and a program plan developed for how the student can carry forward this momentum after graduating from our school. As you can imagine, this is a very expensive uh, activity for any school. It is in the pilot stage at our school. I think we're going to expand it out to cover all students. Um, but our intention is to push very aggressively into the, the, the personalization of education. Parenthetically, uh, the, the, the comment about uh, you know, pharmaceuticals raises a parallel. Some of you may know that one of the hot leading edges in uh, pharmaceutical research is called personalized medicine, which is to, to look at the, you know, the structure of an individual's DNA and the propensities for diseases and illnesses, and from that to begin to structure a regime of anticipatory treatment. Uh, I think that's probably the, the, the distant goal for graduate management education and for the development of leaders. It, I don't think uh, education is as far advanced in the, in the measurement techniques and in the, the tools of delivery as the pharmaceutical industry might be in the delivery of therapeutics, but it's a useful metaphor for where we might be going. Um, the, indeed, the question uh, from uh, Sunil regarded uh, the economic disparities of advanced versus emerging um, economies. And there is a lot to be said that in emerging economies the focus is on cost, in, in advanced economies the focus is, is on new product innovation. And yet I see uh, I, I know of many first-hand exceptions. I'll give you one from our school. Our school has a large institute focused on entrepreneurship and innovation. Students compete to go into, that, in, into the incubator of that institute where they develop new businesses. We've had 60 new businesses start up uh, in the last few years, and among them is a company called Husk Power, which uh, uses a new technology um, to burn rice husks to produce electrical power. And guess where this technology is being sold? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Exactly right. And I'm so proud of these students that, first of all, they, they used the resource, our incubator and the, the funds to, and, and, and the connections to venture capital and the like, to develop this, this company, and now they're taking it out. And this technology is perfect because it uses an agricultural byproduct for which there is plentiful supply in, in Bihar and these other villages to, to produce a, a resource in short supply. Uh, so it's addressing a great social need. I think that uh, what you see in the rising generation of MBA students is in fact a, an increased attention to what we call social entrepreneurship. It's using the context, co concepts and tools of business and MBA training to address uh, social needs such as the lack of uh, electricity and lack of clean water, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's a, a hard and fast separation of uh, developed versus uh, emerging economies. And indeed, if there's one benefit from Indian students studying outside of India, it is for them to seize the ideas and the inspiration from these other countries to bring back and benefit India. And I see this, this happening in, in increasing volume. It used to be that Indian students would come to America or Europe or wherever and study and stay, uh, but I, I, I have good anecdotal experience to suggest the tide may be turning. Thank you. Uh, I did have one last question. Uh, how to encourage entrepreneurship? Um, 
So this raises an equally provocative question, if I may reframe the question slightly. Is, is there a cultural basis for entrepreneurship? Um, is, um, uh, is what Joseph Schumpeter called, you know, the, the agent of creative destruction. Is it socially determined that, that uh, these entrepreneurs will occur in some cultures but not others? And, and uh, therefore, are some economies and some cultures therefore advantaged and are others doomed? Um, I don't think uh, entrepreneurship is culturally determined. I can, I can point to virtually every country in the globe who's, who's come to our school to study to, to argue that the, the students have adopted new, new mindsets, mindsets of uh, innovation and entrepreneurship quite readily. And uh, it may be that the greater uh, barrier to encouraging entrepreneurship occurs in a different place than business school. And I'll tell you a story on America and my own country, but I think it, it is relevant virtually everywhere else. In 2009, so I, I published a book on financial crises, and I was asked to lecture and give views. And in 2009, I met with a large audience. And at the end of the, the speech, and I talked about the origins of financial crises and how awful they are and the consequences. And at the end of it, someone raised her hand and said, so, Professor, what should we do? What can we do to prevent the next crisis? And there are lots of possible answers to this, um, pointing to all the obvious things you may know about government intervention and monetary policy and the like. But I chose to answer this way. I said, in America, we need to fix the public education system from kindergarten through grade 12. And to my astonishment, I got a standing ovation. And I think the, re the, the response of the, the audience was crucial initial 13 years. In the second round, uh, apart from the gentleman who's been smart enough to grab a microphone, can I request that people under 35 should be the ones to ask questions for now? I would really welcome questions from people under 35. Uh, so, uh, if you, you may begin, but keep it short. And the shorter you are, the more time you leave for the professor to respond. Yes, sir. Thank short, you. please. Thank you. I'm Professor Kuldeep Sharma from Berlin Institute of Management Technology, and I'm looking after the Center for Rural Business and Inclusive. Uh, my question is uh, related to your global executive management program, and in that I found that you are covering this program is spread over six countries. Three of them are from the emerging markets, let's say brick uh, structure. Two of them are from the developed world. And I also found in the 15 clusters which you mentioned that one of the key things which is required for inclusiveness that is community development which is missing. My question to you is in this context that for developing global leaders, are we somewhere ignoring the concept of inclusiveness? Thank you. Please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Hello, sir. Uh, my name is Arundhati Ganapati. I am a student of the HR program from the School of Inspired Leadership, Gurgaon. Um, I have two questions. The first one is that we have uh, you've spoken about the importance of competency as a uh, yardstick for measurement. Now the whole concept is, let me speak from a student perspective. I originally hail from Bangalore and uh, the general trend there is engineering because Bangalore is the IT hub, information technology. And then an MBA because it's the access to better jobs and probably a better pay if I can say so. Now from that, coming from such a mindset, when you talk about competency, an average student from such a background would think about what extra will I be getting? You know, how will you address that mindset? And the second one, a uh, second question is that you spoke about 15 clusters, 15 clusters which uh, spoke about you see, you yet to see a school that addresses perseverance and tenacity to be actually implemented, to be actually taught, and the importance of it. You said you are yet to see. How can that be implemented in the B school program as such? Okay, the young lady there. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I'm Gitanjali from Amity School of Business. 
uh, being an academic institute, we already have students who are doing bachelors and masters in business administration. But nevertheless, we would want them to become global leaders. So my question to you is, does Darden offer student exchange programs so that even our students can get an opportunity to be there for a semester or two to get that exposure and that learning? Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, hello, my name is Devanik. Uh, I'm a, like, a teacher in India, but I'm teaching in a municipal school in New Delhi. So my question is like, I mean, I have a lot of friends in Silicon Valley who have their own startups. So you talk about promoting entrepreneurship to business education, right? But there is a notion in Silicon Valley, if you take a business degree, you can't be a successful entrepreneur ever. I mean, why is this a notion? Because each one I talk to, they tell me, Ki, if you want to come to the US, just go. If you come to Silicon Valley, don't have a business degree, just start on your own. So why is this a notion in... One more person under 35. Under 35. <laughs> yes, over there. Sorry? Hello. Uh, myself, Dheeraj Kumar. I am a legal advisor in Dalmia Group. I would like to know one thing. Uh, as a deep actor and de jure, you are the uh, guardian of Darden School of Business. So, my uh, one question which I would like to know from your side. What is your opinion and your view about corporate social responsibility? Good. Thank you for keeping me brief. Thank you very much. Gee, these are great questions. Let's see if I can answer them to your, uh, and, and, and help your thinking in these regards. So, um, the first question was about um, the span of countries we were covering in this global executive MBA program and the, um, if, if I might uh, elaborate on them, it was just why these countries, how did we choose them, how inclusive I think the word was is uh, the, the range of countries by, by focusing only on five countries are we not demonstrating <coughs> exclusivity rather than inclusivity and what does this imply for the development of uh, managers. I think um, the response has to be that we all recognize that there are diminishing returns to a breadth of experience. We have carefully chosen these five countries because of the comparison and contrast they will afford. We have 21 months with these students. The question is how to get the, the maximum, the maxi, out of the, the immersion experiences that we have with them. The simple comparison of <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> India and China, for instance, both robust engines of uh, growth and, and uh, emerging economies, uh, the, the, the comparison couldn't be more stark. Think of what we can do after we've taken the students to both countries and can compare and contrast among them. I don't think going to Vietnam and Indonesia, and you, you can name many other countries, I'm not sure that uh, adding more countries to the list will necessarily deepen immediately the, the learning game. That is to say, I'm, I'm hinting that there may be some diminishing returns to diversity in that case. Certainly the, the, the difference between um, the United States and Europe is another sharp contrast and then the comparison of the developed and emerging economies. I just, uh, it's, it's a judgment call. I think we're making the right judgment, but what's useful is to acknowledge that we are not putting down a physical put, footprint where we go. And the reason for that is we intend to go wherever in the world the, the comparison and contrasts will be most meaningful. And I think this is a lesson to the, the larger field of academia, that too often we, we um, identify ourselves as institutions with bricks and mortar, whereas what the competencies approach would say is we should uh, build our identities around the experiences we create for our students. Um, the, um, the, we had a great question about uh, what, what is, what is uh, somebody who's had an engineering uh, degree from the Silicon Valley of, of uh, India, what, what could uh, this possibly add to one's uh, human stock and this this relates actually to the question over here of you know the, the common critique that you hear in the United States 
if, if you want to be an entrepreneur, go be an entrepreneur. Don't go to business school because that'll just set you back a couple of years. Go be an entrepreneur. I think the, um, the reality is we bring in a, about a, a quarter to a third of our students have engineering uh, preparation or backgrounds. We increasingly get students into our programs who have advanced degrees in engineering and they come to us um, because they're ready for something different. So the Darden School is especially known for developing leaders and general managers. We were ranked number one in the world by Financial Times uh, in the category of general management and what we get are the students who have to their own satisfaction prove their mastery in engineering or finance or accounting or whatever else and they're ready to step up into something new. So, so for many of our students they are career changers or direction changers and that is a gift that school really gets on top of strong technical training and in fact the marriage of training in engineering and training in business is extremely powerful. Um, the, the question about entrepreneurship and uh, Silicon Valley is uh, extremely interesting as well. And there, uh, there's sort of an undertone of, um, and I'm, I'm well familiar with this, I'm not saying you have this view, but there's kind of an anti-intellectual undertone that says, what, what can schools add? And, and the answer is, you know, the school of hard knocks is a very, very hard school. You can chew through a lot of money, you can chew through a lot of time, and you can chew through a lot of people and valuable relationships. A little training in business can help you avoid some very big landmines. So we get, uh, because we have this institute in entrepreneurship and innovation, it's nationally ranked in the United States, we get a very steady flow of people who say on their applications, we want to be entrepreneurs, and indeed we ask them very, very pointed questions. So, why aren't you out starting a business? Why do you want to go to business school to begin with? And the answer is often, well, I have an idea. I want to come to business school to refine the plan, find the first customer, find the first venture backer, and build the prototype of the product, etc. So, for them, business school makes perfect sense as part of the, the, the ramp, the takeoff, uh, into entrepreneurship. <clears throat> we will take our entrepreneurship students through, well, all of our students through about 600 case studies in two years. They'll get an enormous exposure to different industries, different managerial dilemmas. Um, one entrepreneur told me, quite frankly, this is two years of experience, this, excuse me, he said this is 10 years of very hard knocks experience distilled into two years. If you're prepared to learn, if you're prepared to really gain the ideas from uh, an educational system, uh, this is a wonderful beginning. I think uh, the final question had to do with corporate social responsibility, and here too is a wonderful uh, question. Um, in the wake of the global financial crisis and the Great Recession, business schools received quite a bit of criticism. Not quite as bad as the banking industry, mind you, but bad enough. And the question was, what, what responsibility did we have for this? And uh, some of my peer deans evaded it. Some, some uh, just were, were puzzled. But I have a very strong view. And I think that, that we as a field, as management education, can and must do better in imparting to our students and to the corporate partners we work with a much stronger commitment to an understanding of the impact of business in society. But it is a very complicated kind of impact. Issues arise, such as CEO pay. I know this is not so much of an issue in, the, in India, but in the United States, it's a big issue. CEOs are in very high pay relative to the frontline hourly workers. What justifies this? Um, what should we do about it? And I think we, we business schools can help enormously by um, First, uh, the, the research we might do on the drivers of uh, such compensation schemes and deep, more deeply an understanding of why uh, CEO compensation is such a lightning rod in society. I believe it's a lightning rod because of the 
populist feelings that have welled up in the wake of the crisis. Um, there are many other dimensions to corporate social responsibility, but I would tell you that our school is one of the, has one of the strongest departments of business ethics and corporate responsibility in the world. We, we have courses in it. We, we have mandatory exercises in, a, in the required portion of our MBA curriculum. And I would tell you that uh, most students get it, a few don't, uh, but they will get it sooner or later because society inevitably catches up with leaders in one way or another. And I'm cautiously optimistic that by the kinds of things we do in business school, we're helping to prepare a rising generation who will be more sensitive to the needs of society and the impact of business on it. And we will, we will have a third uh, short final round. Uh, time presses. You have the floor, sir, uh, after which too many hands cannot satisfy all. Please, I'm, carry I am Dr. S. Kivachori. I look after good governance in the Amity University. <coughs> Actually, recently, the Time magazine highlighted the value of uh, managers in India and how Indian business managers are rising in the world. I'm sure it must have come to your notice also. Because Time magazine is a magazine from your country only. <coughs> and there's something about the DNA of India, which I would call it family values or upbringing or whatever it is. Probably that's something which you need to look into, and which is something very unique to India. And uh, that thing should be studied. Secondly, the other thing about India is that probably the greatest experiment in commercial ventures was the East India Company of India, which led the rise of the British Empire. <laughs> so India has something which leads to the rise of the British Empire. There must be something in it. So that's something that you should study. And lastly, I want to ask you one thing. You talked about skills, knowledge and attributes. Now, do you bring about some kind of a metamorphosis in your students which leads to a complete change and, and is there something like a garden brand that finally comes out? Yes. <coughs> Professor, my name is Ramesh Vaswani. I am the Vice Chairman of a company called Intex Technologies India Limited. We are into IT hardware and mobile phones. My question is that what is your view on the thought that it is an ecosystem of efficient knowledge management and knowledge dissemination against cross-functional um, cross teams, which is essentially required to nurture global leadership. Uh, oh yeah. Just my question is actually not related to the leadership. And if you allow me, uh, it's about the state of U.S. economy. Uh, you know, please, I think. Okay, fine. Better keep it out, if you don't mind. Uh, okay. Gentlemen here. Uh, I am Professor Rajiv Kumar from Dalgotia's Business School, Dalgotia's University. My question is that when we are talking about attributes, I feel there are certain attributes which are similar in a good global manager and a good politician or political leader. So my question is, as Darden is doing so many things, why not you do something so that some prominent countries like China, India, Russia and US cooperate with each other and develop some good strategy for cooperation, not conflicts. Hmm. Uh, a final question, the gentleman at the back. Uh, I am Sumit Dhanuka from SAR Capital. Uh, the uh, topic on, you know, we dis intend to dis discuss today, my question is, uh, uh, more specific to Indian leaders for the next two or three decades or maybe next five decades where, What are some three or four characteristics which you which you have seen over, over your experience? Which you feel that uh, the Indian le the leaders of Indian corporations today can take it forward to the next level to become uh, global leaders So some three or four characteristics which, are, which, which is essentially can take these Indian leaders to global leaders my sincere apologies to those that I'm simply not able to accommodate because of the time constraint, but you have the pleasure, the privilege, the opportunity of talking to the professor over tea. So please use that opportunity, sir. A so, final round, but before you begin, can I tag on one small question? There is a critique that the two-year MBA is much too long. 
the Europe manages with one year. Any comment on that? My view is, uh, so let me address that first since it's freshest in my mind. Uh, I get this uh, question often and I think it's a valuable and legitimate question. In fact, uh, a couple of schools, strong schools in the U.S. have introduced one-year MBA program formats. And uh, I don't take a doctrinaire view about it, but I, I respond to uh, prospective applicants this way. I would say, what is it that you want to accomplish in this next phase of your life? If you, if you are very, very sure and very clear on what you want out of an educational experience, if, if you have great clarity about the work you will do immediately after, if uh, you're quite sure of the skills you want to acquire to get to that position, um, if, if you are untroubled and unburdened by distractions along the way, then a one-year program makes wonderful sense. Uh, I, I have taught at INSEAD. They have a one-year program. I have very great respect for that school. They pull it off, but I will tell you on the basis of personal observation, there is no time one, uh, one has to stop and reflect, to sample around, uh, to take risks. In a two-year program, you have summer internships, you have many more electives, you, you have uh, two years worth of engagement with companies who might come to recruit, and this tends to create a much broader perspective. So for instance, for career switchers, or people who, may, who, who are just not so sure about the laser-like focus of their lives, I think a two-year program makes great sense. Um, the, these final questions are great and uh, tough, and I'll do my best to respond to them. I think the, the question about uh, Indian uh, family values is uh, a wonderful suggestion. I've been in conversation with some faculty here in India about this very subject, and I would hope that we could engage in joint research between my school and the Indian faculty in this area. Um, the uh, plainly, uh, India has had enormous influence not only on the British Commonwealth system, the colonial system, but uh, even more broadly. Um, you know, this this leads to the question of how do nations uh, contribute to uh, systemic expansion of the global economy. That's a very complicated subject, but uh, it, it, it leads to this one thought. In my study of the Panic of 1907, we, uh, our, our book details how this very, very severe financial crisis in the U.S. spilled over into other countries. Funny thing, a hundred years later, the same thing happened, and we, we don't learn, or at least we don't remember, these effects so readily. And so I think the lesson uh, for business schools and students and for companies who seek to develop leaders is to build this, this broader awareness, this systemic awareness of the impact of companies and managers and their decisions on broader society. Um, yes, I do see a metamorphosis in students. The question was raised, uh, <clears throat> but it is it is like the tide coming in and out. Um, you, the, the, the students don't suddenly change uh, and grow uh, six inches or um, uh, gain weight, not usually, uh, and the like, but they, they demonstrate greater confidence uh, immeasurably. Uh, we send students, ours is a 21-month residential program, and we, we, we give them a very rigorous program of study. They go away for the summers, and. 60% of them come back with offers for full-time employment, which is an astonishingly high number. By, gradu by, by the time they complete the studies, virtually everybody has an offer. But the, the point is that when they come back at the end of the summer, they will volunteer without being asked, you know, I, I didn't think I had learned anything last year. And then I went to work for this great company and I really made a difference. And, and you can see in their eyes the impact of the learning experience they've had. So yes, I think a metamorphosis is occurring, and uh, this is apparent truly over the years uh, that follow. It's not a step function change that one can observe 
very directly. Although this, this coaching program, that end-to-end -end coaching program that I described to you, I think is going to help us uh, build the assessment uh, benchmarks and tools to do just that. Second question had to do with the um, ecosystem of thought. And the, the phrase that was mentioned is uh, managing across functions. In other words, uh, what characterizes management in global enterprises is a matrix organization. There are the functions, and then there are the regions, and the people who are stuck in every individual cell are often in, in, a, in a very, very complicated place in, in business life and in, in uh, their own careers. Um, so much of what they have to do is mediate between among the demands of the, uh, the function as well as the, the region and indeed the demands of the entire enterprise. What we can do as schools is develop models and develop teaching materials that help to imbue in our students the sensitivity and understanding and capability for having impact in that very complicated setting. I love the question about uh, building uh, global um, cooperation. Indeed, in, in some of our courses, we teach conflict resolution, we teach multi-party negotiation, we teach uh, war games, conflict games and the like in strategy courses, and explicitly draw on examples from, of geopolitical conflict. And the larger point I would make is that it's not clear that business school is just about business. I believe that the, the skills, the attributes, the competencies we develop in our students are applicable, applicable across a wide range of uh, spheres of activity. Um, in fact, the mission of the Darden School as it is said, is to develop principled leaders in the world of practical affairs. This phrase, practical affairs, comes from the writings of Thomas Jefferson, the third president of, of uh, the United States and the author of our Declaration of Independence, who, who, who founded the University of Virginia in his retirement as a hobby and uh, made, left an extraordinary legacy thereby. But what we see among our graduates is not a linear career progression, but a, um, an eccentric, episodic career progression. Our, our graduates will go into business and then often into an, an NGO or a not-for-profit, maybe an entrepreneurial work, then sometimes into government and back and forth. And their, their careers will progress, but in a non-traditional way. And I think, again, referring back to my uh, my contacts in Japan with their very rigid sense of career progression. If, if anything is true about the new generation of business, emerging business leaders we see in business schools today, it is that they will not conform to the uh, traditional view of a linear career advancement. Um, finally, uh, w there was a wonderful question at the end about uh, referring specifically to business, uh, to Indian leaders and the characteristics we might uh, refer to them for um, becoming global leaders. It is um, yet early in our research on attributes of leadership to, to offer a, um, a national or ethnocentric uh, answer to that question. But I will tell you that in my, in my week here, uh, I've gotten so many questions referring to what I might call the stereotypes of uh, Indian MBA students. And people want to know, so, so Dean, you have these MBA students at your school. Do they talk? Do they have a work ethic? Are they, uh, are they serious about what they do? I mean, Dean, they can't really be entrepreneurial, can they? And on and on and on. And it makes me wonder, what planet are these questions coming from? Because the students I see at the Darden School uh, really adapt. Now it may be that there's a selection bias and that the students who naturally come from India, cross borders, to this strange place in the United States are already pioneers in, in mentality and uh, audacious and have great determination. But what I see coming from your nation is an extraordinary 
uh, expression of Indian culture and talent. I was telling others today that uh, students at our school are organizing a cricket league, which is a first at our university, uh, and they intend to win uh, the cup, whatever the cup is, wherever it is, uh, playing other schools. Uh, we have other students who are teaching Americans how to prepare curry, hot, hot curry, and eat it and like it. Uh, we have other students who are taking leadership positions. Indeed, a student who grew up in Chennai is the vice president of our student body and uh, brings wonderful maturity and vision to our community. So I tell you this to say um, it, it's difficult for me to speak to a, a stereotype of what might characterize Indian business leaders today, but I am confident from the, the sample that I see coming through the Darden School that there is a wonderful new pool of talent coming and I'm, I'm fairly confident that they will come back to give back to India in their own way and at their own time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop. It, it remains for me only to say two words. First, that the fact that you've held a room full of professors and students spellbound is evidence of the power of the idea that you have presented. You have really offered us a rich uh, a banquet of ideas and concepts on which one can reflect and chew over a period of time. I have just two comments I want to make in a personal way. Number one, you said that for the great part you did not think that there were uh, uh, ethnic or ethno-cultural attributes to entrepreneurship. I would submit to you that the range of Indian experiences might perhaps lead you to a somewhat different conclusion. Uh, Joel Kotkin uh, has authored a book in which he has looked at the global phenomenon of certain groups, often minorities, who have tended to be entrepreneurial. The, um, the Muslimite people of Algeria and the Marwaris who moved <coughs> out of Marwa for reasons of demography are in a strange way evidence of this. The second point I want to make is uh, you said that lots of people asked you about the quality of Indian students and whether they were serious. See, behind this is a, is a kind of uh, schizophrenic personality that we Indians have. We are extraordinarily optimistic. This is my humble view. You may dismiss it. We are extraordinarily optimistic, but we are also tremendously pessimistic. We say, oh, and you can't do this. I mean, you know, and yet we say, damn it, we are going to be uh, the world's superpower. So there is this kind of divide. And as you will see, um, the more Indians you meet, perhaps the more confused you will get. <laughs> so I would, I would recommend stick to the guys who are your students at school and you will probably get the best assessment of India out of it. It remains only for me to request you please to put your hands together and thank uh, <laughs> Thank you.